the, the reality is, is regardless of the characteristics of what brings the disruption on, it is a signal to us that we have an opportunity to grow. Hello and welcome to Out of the Fog. I'm Karen Hager. Each week at this time, we gather for spiritual conversation with enlightening guests, and I'm glad you're here. You can find out more about my work as an intuitive and as a teacher at karenhager.com. Now then, what happens when our sense of who we are gets turned upside down? That can be sparked by an unexpected layoff or a, a health crisis. It could even be the arrival of a milestone, like my kids moved out of the house or it's my ex, whatever it is, birthday today. What happens when that sense of who we are gets turned upside down? Well, my sense, my guest today is Linda Rossetti. She says that we often misunderstand what's happening at those times and that that can make us miss out on the advantages that these moments of disruption bring. Are you ready to meet her? Linda Rossetti is a business leader, Harvard MBA, former Fortune 500 executive, and pioneering researcher on individuals' experiences at the crossroads of their lives. She's the founder of the Transition Institute. That's a firm that partners with corporations, nonprofits, and individuals on a new way to successfully move through major changes. Linda's work has been featured on NPR, NECN, CBS, Money Magazine, Smart Brief, the BBJ, and other outlets. Her newest book is Dancing with Disruption, a new approach to navigating life's biggest changes. And you can find out more about Linda and her work at lindarossetti.com. Linda, welcome to Out of the Fog. Karen, thank you. It's so nice to be here with you. It it feels to me that we are kind of in a festival of disruption disruption of Palooza, right? The the pandemic disrupted what it seemed like the settled order of things. There's deep division around politics and beliefs, and that disrupts our ability to speak compassionately with each other and, and so on. How does this setting of disruption of Palooza intensify or amplify our, our own personal journeys? Oh, Karen, I love that question. And it really, from my perch, it looks as if we are going to all need to develop an increasing capability of dealing with upheaval in our lives, right? Because this, this macro sense that you reference, whether it's in the politics arena, economics, you know, we have workplaces being completely undone by technology. You know, we have this new AI thing that's coming up. But, you know, for decades, robotics have displaced workers in the workplace, right? So we have all these various kind of spheres that are being disrupted. And in all of that really speaks to this notion that we all need to get a set of skills um, um, kind of advanced to a level where they can be useful to us because we will increasingly be faced with disruption, you know, in, in all facets of our lives. And, and part of the reason why I do my work is to make sure this conversation is happening because today, our skill sets are really underdeveloped in this arena of trying to respond to, you know, significant shifts in how we've come to know ourselves. Hmm. So there's an enormous opportunity to have conversations like the one you and I are having, um, because it, the, the world is kind of delivering us to this doorstep to say, you know, how are we going to dance? And, and, you know, too many people are sitting on the sideline right now, not because they've done something wrong. It's because we haven't as a society kind of opened this conversation. What potential for change is there when we do open that conversation, when we start to use those tools, when we're free to make choices around this? What changes? Oh, my gosh. You know, I I, I can tell you a story, Karen, right? You know, I've done research for more than a decade on this topic of what happens when somebody's kind of self-concept or their identity gets buffeted or, or in worst case, broken or lost. And so I have all these stories and there's this one lovely gentleman who participated and he sat down next to me and he said, you know, I see so much more now. And the fascinating thing, Karen, was this man was 100% sight impaired. He had no vision. 
And he <laughs> said, I see so much more now. And I think that's the magnitude of that is what's possible for all of us that, you know, if we learn how to respond differently to these moments when what may be a stable self con concept gets gets ruffled or or broken, um, if we can respond differently, really, there are no boundaries, right? You know, the the benefits are quite extraordinary. And, and you know, I, I've worked with hundreds of people and, and can demonstrate that those of us who are willing to have a new conversation at those moments um, can really create a positive inflection point in our lives. And, and so, you know, um, I see so much more now um, and that from a person who had hmm. no meaningful sight. Um, I think that that's what the, what's available. What well, opens possibilities? There are we connect with the, we connect with the world in our in the ways we're used to connecting. I connect through this relationship or this job or through the medium of my physical sight. And sometimes when there's change, when it's all turned on its head, we see more. As he said, right? We it opens possibilities. We can start to experiment a little bit with what could be possible for us. Yes, it's so it's so interesting you pick up on that. And that's why I love, love your podcast. And, um, you know, Out of the Fog is is such a beautiful title, right? Because really what I've learned is that, first off, there's some vocabulary that I think is important that maybe your listeners would enjoy, right? There are some words that we've been taught um, to mean kind of equivalency, right? We have, We use the word change and transition interchangeably in our society. But when we're at moments, of instability and in our self-concept, they actually mean very different things, right? When we are at a point where there's a break, you know, say there's, you know, a loss or, you know, um, uh, we've we've gotten remarried and our sense of stability is just flipped upside down, right? It can, can be all sorts of things that bring us to these moments. But when we make changes at those times, right? And changes are really alterations or variations on things that are knowable, right? Largely something we can articulate. Um, what we're doing is we're leaving intact our self-concept, right? We're saying that is a static concept and we're, we're making alterations, but we're really adding to the stability of that self-concept. And that is change when we reach for change at these moments. But when we reach for transition, we're acknowledging that there's a shift in our self-concept. And that is really a very um, substantial divide because when, we, when we're willing to recognize a transition, we're saying that there's a shift in something that holds value and meaning to us. And at that point, we welcome instability for a time. You know, the outcome of that process is largely unknown, but we welcome that instability as we re-examine the assumptions, you know, upon which we anchor our self-concept. And so, you know, this, this notion that I, I, I introduced, which says really it's time to have a new conversation about disruption. Oftentimes the first thing that I invite people to do is, is think about, well, which camp am I in, right? Am I in a moment that says, you know what? I just, you know, for real reasons, I'm going to make some alterations. I have to hang on to some stability. Or am I at a moment where I'm ready to acknowledge, you know, you know what? No, this is different. And, and it's time to maybe re-examine some assumptions I have about my capacity, my values. Um, and, and it is with that choice that we embark on a very transformational path. And scary, though. I mean, that's kind of scary. You sort of took the walls away there. Absolutely. You know, it, it is. And it's interesting um, you, you reference that our first reaction, right, when we go into this place where we we welcome instability, our emotions mobilize to keep us safe, right? Their, their job, our emotions job at that moment is to staple our feet to the floor so we don't move, right? Because they want to keep us safe. And, and there's been some fascinating research on this over decades. In fact, some of my favorite comes from this gentleman. His name was Jack Mesereau. He worked at Columbia University. He's now long deceased, but his work is fascinating because he evaluated what happens at those terrifying moments when we say, oh my goodness, I'm going to set out on an unknown path. And he said, you know, two things have to happen at that point. One thing has to be very practical, right? Which is, okay, if it's not this path, which exact path am I going to do? What's my next step going to be? But he said, there's also a parallel and equally important path 
or activity that is oftentimes ignored. And that is responding to the intense emotional reactions to that shift. And that's why in my book and, and in my work, I spend so much time talking about new methods to reframe emotions, because we really do have to diffuse the power of emotions over us in order to kind of embark on these paths. And once we do, we can really, we can really kind of tamp down or, or kind of deflate the fears hold on us. It doesn't go away, but we can be with it in a very different way. You know, so Karen, appropriately to note that, oh my gosh, fear is right here. It's like at my fingertips, I'm terrified, but there's no reason that it has to have power over us. So it's not that the emotions themselves are are bad. If you're scared, you can never go through transition. If you're scared, you'll never have the change. It's not that the emotions are bad. What I'm hearing you say is that the emotions tell us something and then and then we have choices about how we use that instead of so instead of me always making choices from fear, I can sit with that fear, observe it and and make choices going forward. Absolutely. And I have to say, you know, my, my favorite, my favorite conclusion out of my research was that emotions are actually oracles, not obstacles. Right. Oh. And isn't that, is it, it's, it's incredibly powerful. And to see that it was so clear emotions are oracles, not obstacles. And I came up or created this, this technique called hail, which is a, a technique that helps people really reframe emotions, letting go of their oppositional nature and embracing them as an oracle or a, you know, a kind friend walking next to us. Which is, which brings compassion into a time where fear will come up. I love, I love that. I'm keeping that emotions are oracles, <laughs> not, I'll, I'll just send you a dollar 95 every time I say there it. Emotions- every time they have it. <laughs> you know, oracles, not obstacles. Yes. And so, and this notion of reframing, right, Karen, we use this word over and over again in our society, but let me tell you a little bit about how I use it, right? Reframing to me is as if you and I kind of stepped outside today and I said, okay, Karen, um, draw me that tree that's right in front of us. And you got to work and sketched it out. And then I said, okay, come, come with me. And we, we went across the street and climbed up onto the roof of a neighboring home. And then I said, okay, Karen, now I want you to draw that very same tree. And what that is, is that helps us take what is right in front of us, a familiar something and see it from an entirely new angle. And so this technique that I created is called HAIL, and it's spelled H-A-I-L. It is a mnemonic, meaning every step uh, or every one of the letters, the four letters in the word stands for a step of the technique. And so this notion of hailing our emotions allows us to reframe them from being oppositional to being oracles. And it really is, you know, back to Jack Mesereau's work, it is an incumbent upon us to really teach people who are going the, through these periods of major transformation that there's really nothing to fear here. The emotions that are coming up are really um, working to try to keep you safe and that we can help people rethink about those emotions, m- emotions and quite honestly, learn from them in ways that are beautiful and affirming and supportive as we go forward. You're listening to Out of the Fog, and I'm talking talking with Linda Rossetti. Her new book is Dancing with Disruption, a new approach to navigating life's biggest changes. You can find out more about Linda and her work at lindarossetti.com. That's Rossetti with two S's and two T's, lindarossetti.com. Linda, what does it mean to reimagine ourselves in in the throes of that emotion and in the throes of resistance i take the understanding like i've got to reimagine myself like, like okay i can't be me anymore i have to be i don't know shiny vegan karen who never does anything wrong and always smiles and here i'm reimagining myself that's not what you're talking about you're talking about a much deeper level of work so what does that mean to reimagine ourselves right and i, I thank you for that question because i think a lot of times we We don't give it enough time, right? What does it really mean to step through this transformative process that we're talking about? And let me step back and say a minute about how we create the identities that we hold, right? Mm -hmm. Very often when we enter adulthood, 
the way we create our definition and expectation for ourselves is really drawn from what I'll call our surround. And that is the people and places and things that are around us. So we draw from um, the communities we live in, the educations we've received, our families, our religious affiliations, the work we choose to do, right? So our definition and expectation for ourselves as we enter early adulthood is really drawn from a composite of all these external influences. And as we go through repetitive disruptions, right, where our self-concept gets called into question, um, we have the opportunity to kind of reevaluate those assumptions that we anchor our self-concept on. And those that choose to go through that process begin to re-examine those very assumptions. And what's happening is we're saying, you know what? You know, that assumption where it said, okay, I need to be a general manager by the time I'm 40, or I need to be, you know, I need to, um, you know, create the largest community uh, services organization the planet has ever seen, whatever the assumptions are that we pick up for ourselves, we kind of say, well, wait a minute, um, maybe that's outlived its useful life. And we basically go through this process of raising our awareness to the assumptions that we carry, and then reevaluating them. And the process is really a recentering of ourself so that we become more self-authored, right? The things that are important to us instead of things that we may have adopted from others, mm -hmm. those things that are important to us kind of take the space of things that might have occupied an earlier expression of who we are. And so what we are doing, this recentering, is we're taking this notion of ourself, our identity, our self-concept, and we're saying, hang on. What is it today that is important to me that's aligned with who I am, my voice? And, and really, what does it mean to live in alignment with that voice? And, and I want to be careful. When I use the word voice, I'm not meaning what you hear audibly when I open my mouth and speak. When I use the word voice, I'm meaning our truth and our essence. And, and you know, it, it isn't kind of all of a sudden we flick the switch on and we know the answer to that, right? Because really this progression we've made through adulthood when we early on adopted some kind of voiceovers from others, we really need to go through a process to really think about, you know, what is our, our, our essence or our truth? And, and that isn't a five minute step, right? So it's this iterative process of raising our awareness to kind of who we are and what has value to us. And that isn't in kind of like self-absorbed way. It's really trying to kind of clear the fog, if I can, you know, borrow your phrase, clear the fog out so that we can have clarity on those things that are really part of our essence and then use those as a way to align or act in concert um, with who we are in, in, in touch with the world. And it, it radically, like my friend who said, oh my goodness, I, I see so much more now. Mm -hmm. It radically changes the lens that we're able to not only look through, but be, um, you know, as we, as we occupy space. And it's fascinating because, you know, as I, as I work with people, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with hundreds of people in doing this research and reaching these conclusions, you know, this notion of, of what's happening when our sense of self gets buffeted is it's really an invitation to come into our own voice. And we learn so much about ourselves through accepting this somewhat untethered, unstable moment um, to explore, and we get enormous power from, from the journey. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm answering your question, Karen. I feel like I'm talking so long, but this, this possibility is really about recentering um, kind of our own voice. And I remember there were these two lovely women. I, I did an event in Chicago um, uh, not so long ago, you know, right after my first book came out. And these two women came running up to me afterwards and one was in tears. And she said, Linda, oh my goodness, I can hear my voice. It's screaming at me. Mm. But, but the prospect of acting in concert with that voice was terrifying to her. She's like, I have so much to lose. Oh. And almost at the exact same minute, another woman came up next to her and she put her hand over her eyebrows and she looked from left to right like a seafarer, you know, from a long ago age. And she said, I'm searching for my voice. I haven't heard it in 30 years. 
right? So I, I just say that those two examples to, to illustrate that part of this process of, of dancing with disruption is honoring the fact that our voices are at different um, moments in their progression. And so part of the work, um, you know, if people want to, um, you know, go to their public library and get the book Dancing with Disruption or, or choose a copy for themselves, part of the work is really giving people the tools to raise their awareness to their current status of their voice, and then give them the tools to act in alignment um, to what it means um, to be in that new space. Wow. And that, what I would say just from my own work as a teacher, if that voice is shouting, listen to it, but don't let it command you. Um, someone wise said on this program just a couple of weeks ago, just because you feel something doesn't mean you have to do anything right away. Part of honoring that inner voice is in allowing it to speak, allowing the kind of the temperature to go down a little bit so that yelling can just become conversation. So that you as the person who's driving the body, this is just my way of looking at it, right? But we're driving the meat suit, right? This time around, you as the person who's driving the body, you get to decide. Um, so that no a, a voice that's shouting right sometimes might not be your inner voice. Very true. And, and you know, this notion of becoming aware of our voice does not invite recklessness, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is it is not, right? It, it simply is one of the steps in a progression of growing into that voice. And, and um, in the book, I talk a lot about um, this, this um, framework that I call the incubator, which has a number of steps. There are four steps about resetting our expectations, reimagining our identity, reconstituting the connections that are around us, and then reframing emotions, which we've already talked about. But those four steps all have to be activated in order to really make the informed choices that people people can benefit from so there's no recklessness involved <laughs> well and that we there's a gift of time that comes sometimes when things get turned upside down we miss the fact that this has given us some time right it's an invitation for sure and, and there's time to one of the things i like about the book is that the steps are clear you share a lot of stories about people who from all different situations have gone through their own paths. And one of the takeaways that I got is that, that there's time I'm allowed to sit with the disruption in my life. And from that place, build a foundation for changing who I am and how I respond. So there's yes, and Karen, time. you know, the beautiful thing also that you pick up, which is so important is that a lot of times people start small, right? It, it isn't often that there is a, like a grand um, change. Like, you know, usually it, it starts with a component of ourselves, right? Maybe it starts with our spirituality or our occupation or a relationship or, um, you know, a, a physicality, a way, a capability that we may have once had, or it's changing. And, and, you know, Oftentimes when people think about, oh my goodness, you know, a, a transformation, that's like a whole scale. I have to leave everything, go to something new. And it very rarely is that. In fact, I would argue that it it really is this process that allows with time us to work on something and build some new capabilities and then perhaps work on something more, right? So, you know, my progression started with a with an occupational um, kind of hiccup that I, I just couldn't, I couldn't put any words around. And once I got some runtime on that, which by the way, took me almost five years to get a real handle on that. Um, then I began to do some work on some relationships that were really close to me. And so, you know, it is, it is a process where time walks with us, um, but it is so important to start because yes. Because as we begin to get a connection to our voice, we are able to withstand body blows and not get pushed down, right? It is really interesting to watch how people um, interact with successive rounds of disruption after they begin this, this march to connect um, with their own truth. And it is really, it's remarkable to observe that, you know, if we're willing to entertain instability, even for a time, you know, in a small part of who we are, we build muscle memory about how to do this and that benefits us. And, and back to your initial question, this notion that we have this, this macro 
disruption happening in nearly every frame in the world, um, building that capability is essential. And that I like, I love what you're saying here that it brings in the idea that there will be more disruption, that being at a crossroads, that reimagining ourselves doesn't mean that from now on I go on seamlessly a shiny vegan Karen who does everything right and never makes a mistake. <laughs> that flowing with this creates resilience. Yes, mental and emotional and energetic and physical resilience maybe. And it also creates the the wider view that lets you move through successive waves of disruption. There's a, sometimes in people I work with, there's a an idea that they bring that disruption is a punishment or that change or transition is that, that things happen to, to punish us for not being good enough, for not doing it right, for making mistakes. And I see, and it sounds like you do too, disruption and change, even when it's not delightful and not something that I would have been happy to ask for, it always opens a door to something else. Never a punishment, always an opening door. Absolutely. And, and it is, um, you know, I, I do think that it's an artifact of the way we set our definition and expectation for ourselves early on that's so external that helps us put that those negative vocabulary words around mm -hmm. these these inevitable um, disruptions that occur. But, you know, now after sitting with 300 people and, and also during the pandemic, I began to do my doctoral work in human development and, and feel as if now I've, I've gone through almost all the scholarly research on this field. The, the reality is, is regardless of the characteristics of what brings the disruption on, it is a signal to us that we have an opportunity to grow what it is, is adult growth. You know, we're, we're fantastic with young children, right? We watch carefully to say, oh my goodness, have they gone through a developmental milestone? And if they haven't, we get them early intervention and we are on it as a society. But what we miss is that as, as adults, we also, also have growth opportunities. And a great majority of what's happening as we're meeting disruption is this almost consciousness signaling us that there's more, that there's more for us. And, and that is such a lovely invitation that gets missed oftentimes because the emotions that queue up, um, but often, oftentimes because society has helped us kind of hang this negative ornamentation around, around so many um, events that are characteristic of our lives. You know, I, I hear so much is like, oh, I've failed or there's something wrong with me, or, you know, I've done something wrong. And, and in fact, those are all, I, I want to honor those feelings. None of them are wrong, those feelings, but they aren't really what's happening. What's happening is, is we're getting signaled that there's growth and more. And, and that's a beautiful thing. Linda, how can listeners connect with you and find out more about what you're doing in the world? Well, thank you. Um, my website is a great place to start and you've already referenced it. Thank you. My last name is a real trick. It's Rosetti, R-O-S-S-E-T-T-I. So lindarosetti.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn and my books are available at most libraries. So if you're in the United States, you can ask um, for the book Dancing with Disruption at your public library, but it's also available in podcasts, excuse me, in audiobook electronic and physical versions wherever books are sold. I love it. Linda, thank you so much for talking with us today. Karen, it's been such an honor. Thank you. I've been talking with Linda Rossetti. Her new book is Dancing with Disruption, a new approach to navigating life's biggest changes. You can find out more at lindarossetti.com. Get ready. I'm going to spell. Are you ready? L-I-N-D-A-R-O-S-S-E. TTI.com, Linda Rossetti.com. And of course, you're always welcome over at KarenHager.com. That's a great place to find out about upcoming classes and events. You can even book a private intuitive session with me there if it feels aligned. And you can find me on Instagram where I'm posting, <laughs> yes, out of the fog content, but pictures of jigsaw puzzles I'm working on and cool things I see when Maisie, the dog, and I take a walk around the block. So all of that's there on Instagram. I'm Fog City Psychic there. And thank you for listening today. Together we are spreading a little more light in the world and a little more light is always a good thing. Until next time, I'm wishing you peace. <laughs>